Whether it's Top Gun Maverick or Iron Man, it's a pretty safe bet that whenever Hollywood talks modern air combat, there'll be a monologue or two on whether the future looks manned or unmanned. Your Hollywood drone advocate might argue that manned fighters are basically obsolete, that drones are increasingly cheap, effective, free of all human frailties, and ultimately, if it comes down to it, much more easily sacrificed. Meanwhile, the manned fighter advocate on screen will argue it's not the plane, it's the pilot, that a machine cannot properly replace the decision-making capacity, intuition, or perception of a pilot, and that as a result, the manned fighter will continue to be the dominant weapon of air superiority. And in their defence, nations around the world probably wouldn't be spending billions developing sixth-generation manned fighters if they thought they were going to be useless. You can argue this sort of debate is pretty common throughout history whenever you see a disruptive technology introduced that nonetheless has a couple of drawbacks. If I was designing an army in the era of early muzzle-loading firearms, for example, I might ask the question, do I issue comparatively more of my troops with pikes in order to protect them against cavalry or give them additional shock power if close combat breaks out? Or do I want to issue more of these comparatively newfangled guns in order to increase my ability to deliver hurt at range? But sometimes the solution might be, why not a little bit of both? For a long time, pikes and firearms coexisted. And then you could argue with the invention of proper bayonets, armies basically combined them, joining a spiky bit of metal at the end of a long bit of wood to the primary implement of infantry firepower. And so as air forces around the world prepare for future air combat, their approach is often less how do you pick one winning system and how do you combine things like the manned, the unmanned and the munitions together into a single force that is significantly greater than the sum of its parts. And so if in the past we've talked about the race to develop manned sixth generation fighters, Today, I thought it was time to talk about the sprint to develop drone wingmen to fly and fight alongside them. We'll start with a bit of a crash course in automation, policy, and air combat drones 101. As part of that, I'll discuss some of the general strengths and weaknesses of semi-autonomous unmanned systems, basically why you may or may not want a drone. Then I'll specifically look at the concept of manned-unmanned teaming in an air combat environment. How might you get drones and manned fighters working together, for example, and why would you do it? Then, just as we did in the sixth generation fighter episode, we're gonna look at some national programs of note. Looking at several European efforts, including the Russian one, a very brief overview of what's happening in China, and then a deep dive into the program we arguably know the most about, which is the US Air Force's cooperative combat aircraft. Finally, I'll pivot to trying to be a little more forward-looking, asking not just what it might look like when ChatGPT's Top Gun watching cousin takes to the air for the first time, but instead the way these systems and their capabilities might evolve over time and the potentially massive implications that might have for air forces and the defence economics of air force design. But before we jump into it, a quick word from a sponsor. Now today's sponsor is a little bit different because they're entirely non-profit. 80,000 Hours is an organisation whose goal is to try and help you and others build a career that makes a positive impact. Their core idea is that the average adult is going to have about 80,000 hours in their average working life. Now that presumes a 40 hour work week over a 40 year career, which for millennials probably seems optimistically short, but here's the point. Those hours are gonna be one of the best assets you, I, or anyone is ever gonna to have to make a difference. The question is, how can you spend those hours in a way that both gives you a fulfilling career and also has an impact? 80,000 Hours wants to help you find a career that lets you do exactly that. They have a website that sets out to provide what many of us will probably wish our career counselors had research on career impacts, decision-making tools, career guides and reviews, and a range of other resources. And they stress that all of that is based on a decade of research working alongside academics from Oxford University. They have a podcast, a newsletter, a jobs board. They even offer one-on-one -on -one career advice calls if that's something you think you could benefit from. And again, it's all free. If that sounds like something that could help you, there's a link in the description that will get you a copy of their careers guide, their newsletter, and hopefully get you started towards a meaningful career that may well touch on some of the world's great problems. And so with the best of luck to you and my thanks to 80,000 hours, let's get back to it. Okay, so before we jump into a discussion of how drones may or may not dominate the future of air combat, we first need to do a quick 101 on autonomy and unmanned systems in general. Because the colloquial term drone is often used super generically to describe everything from an off-the-shelf quad rotor to a semi-autonomous submarine. And in that massively wide family of all unmanned systems everywhere, not everything is created equal, not by a long shot. And one of the biggest differences between them and one of the most applicable in an air combat context is their level of autonomy. At one extreme, you have drones in UAS that are unmanned, yes, but have absolutely no autonomy. An example of this might be all the small quadrotor drones you see bombing trenches in Ukraine. Now, yes, those are unmanned and we generally call them drones, 
but overwhelmingly they're being flown directly by human operators. And their capacity for independent autonomous decision-making is somewhere between that of a rock and an earthworm. At best, if they lose connection with their operator, they'll generally be able to follow one last protocol. Whether that be landing exactly where they are or flying back to a designated recovery location, while at worst, they're going to lemming right into the dirt. You don't give these systems instructions so much as you just remotely pilot them. They're not robots, they're puppets connected by entirely digital strings. At the other extreme would be a weapon system that's entirely autonomous. The Pentagon would define that as a weapon system that, once activated, can select and engage targets without further intervention from a human operator. A fully autonomous drone wouldn't be piloted so much as given general instructions. In that sense, a fully autonomous drone would be kind of like a human pilot. You may not tell them exactly what targets to engage and how to do it. Instead, you might give them a mission like escort that aircraft to a target area and leave it up to them to identify potential threats and make the decision when to engage and how. But for some reason, sarcasm intended, giving machines the ability to decide for themselves when and how to deploy potentially lethal force is something that many nations consider problematic from a policy perspective. Indeed, as late as 2020, Germany was still having a debate on the ethics of putting weapon systems on their unmanned Heron drones. This was despite the fact that Heron was a remote-controlled system with very limited autonomy. And so many, but not all, nations currently put some legal restrictions around the development and deployment of fully autonomous weapons. If you want to develop a fully autonomous weapon in the United States, for example, that doesn't fall within a number of stated exceptions, jammers and e-war systems, for example, are allowed to be autonomous, then according to DOD Directive 3000.09, then you need the approval of a vast array of senior defence officials. Instead, what most countries aim for and what most of the systems we're going to talk about today utilise is usually a sort of compromise position, semi-autonomy. And a semi-autonomous weapon is one that is only intended to engage individual targets or a specific target groups that have been selected by a human operator. If you tell a semi-autonomous drone to launch a missile against a particular tank, for example, the drone might be able to calculate its own flight path towards the target and determine exactly when it's going to release the missile. But the decision to destroy the tank in that scenario belongs to a responsible and hypothetically accountable human operator. As the quote there on the screen from Colonel Mark Polini put it, you have to have a human within the decision cycle at some point to authorise the engagement. This is sometimes called a human in the loop mode of operation and can be one of the reasons, as we'll discuss later, that you might want to team up manned and unmanned systems rather than letting your autonomous kill jets fly around unsupervised in enemy territory. But questions of human supervision aside, why would or wouldn't you want to use a drone in warfare? What, for example, are some of the general advantages that set at least semi-autonomous unmanned systems apart? And on the flip side, where might humans still have them beat? There's a huge range of reasons that unmanned and semi-autonomous systems have been growing in importance year by year. If you feed a drone known and familiar sorts of information, it'll often be able to process them much, much faster than any human operator could. An unmanned system doesn't get tired, doesn't get hungry, and critically, doesn't get bored. Plus, as long as you've got the budget, you're never going to miss your recruiting quotas. Because compared to a manned system coupled with its pilot or operator, drones are generally going to be much cheaper, often smaller, and far easier to replicate. You still have to pay the various personnel that support their operation, but you don't have to pay the drone itself for salary or retirement benefits. And then you can throw in the obvious political and moral reality that most forces are going to much prefer to lose a piece of equipment than a human operator. Bring that together and you've got a recipe for systems that are going to be particularly well suited for jobs that are boring, repetitive, simple, dangerous, or some combination of the above. Plus, if you're then willing to add in some degree of autonomy to the system, then it might be capable of doing those jobs to some degree even if it loses contact temporarily or permanently with its human operators. If the job is predictable but requires consistency and precision, then you can expect at least some designers are going to be scoping out a potential unmanned solution. Air-to-air -air refueling is just one example we've seen demonstrated with things like the MQ-25 Stingray shown on screen here. But when it comes to autonomous systems, there are also limits. Some of those are moral and political, as we discussed earlier. Governments and societies ultimately wanting people to be responsible for decisions that may lead to the death or injury of other people. But there's also just a basic problem of capability with where most of our technology is right now. The programming or autonomy core that you put into an autonomous system might be incredibly quick to process information and be incredibly precise in doing what you have trained it to do. But they can also be dumb as absolute rocks when faced with anything they don't recognise, 
and usually lack any good common sense analogue to help them self-correct if they go off the reservation. They're only as good as the scope and quality of the programming or learning process that went into creating them, which is how you come up with things like recipe bots recommending recipes that would create poison gas, or self-driving cars that saw kangaroos for the first time and had no bloody idea how to predict their movements. The intelligence of autonomous systems can be impressive, but it can also be very narrow. If you want just one reported example to help demonstrate the concept, let me pull out one from a book by Dr. Paul Shah, who used to work at the office of the Secretary of Defence. He recounts the tale of an autonomous system at DARPA being placed in the middle of a circle and then a group of marines being given the task to sneak up on it. The system had been trained to detect humans, and the humans in this case had to get close enough to touch it without being detected in order to win. And so, marines being marines, as the story goes, they basically trolled the heck out of it. One reportedly held branches from a tree in front of them as they walked towards it, while another two, and I'm quoting directly from the text here, hid under a cardboard box. You could hear them giggling the whole time, end quote. The book then goes on to say that the AI system had been trained to detect humans walking, not humans somersaulting, hiding in a cardboard box, or disguised as a tree. Meaning for once, the Metal Gear Solid school of peak stealth actually held true. The point being illustrated here is that while you can design a program or train an AI to potentially be very, very good at certain things, they may be terrible at dealing with almost anything else. If the software in question is designed to pick out and recognise humans, that's what it's going to do. A human operator looking at a cardboard box steadily edging forward while giggling sounds emanate from inside is probably going to know something is up, but the system's not going to have that common sense to lean on. You told it to go out and recognise humans, and humans are not normally rectangular shaped and covered in packing tape. And if you think the next solution is just to train it to know that moving cardboard boxes might be suspicious, well, that might sound all well and good until it starts levelling Amazon warehouses as dense concentrations of enemy combatants. You can absolutely iterate and improve recognition and decision making over time. But you can't exactly reduce the entire sum of human knowledge and common sense down to a series of if-then statements. And if you want to talk about places where a system might face an unexpected threat and where the consequences of getting it wrong are about as high as they can be, well, the battlefield is probably pretty high on the list. So what you really want is an option which combines all of the advantages of a human with all of the advantages of autonomous unmanned systems. We need a system that's capable of effectively understanding and responding to unknown or novel situations without cluster bombing a cardboard factory or standing there helpless as a marine holding a tree in front of them repeatedly punches it in the face. So far, however, we haven't figured out a way to get drone intelligence to that level, nor have we found a way to make fighter pilots cheap and disposable. And so I suppose at least until one of those two things happen, defence planners seem to have fallen back on an old military maxim. Teamwork makes the dream work. Whether that dream is slightly increasing corporate productivity or decisively achieving air superiority over hostile airspace. Because remember the sort of things that defence planners might be trying to achieve here. They want a human brain involved to appraise the situation locally and to make potentially difficult decisions. We don't want missions failing because some computer system decided to bug out at an inopportune moment. No, we want them failing for good old-fashioned reasons like human error. Humans are also much more difficult to neutralise using electronic warfare. A drone that loses long-range communications might be muted, whereas a human may just enjoy the quiet and then continue with the job. But at the same time, we want to fully leverage the capacity of unmanned systems. Reduced risk, affordability, unique capabilities, we've been over this. But here's the key. You don't need one platform that combines all of these characteristics. You just need a system, a unit. And so you arrive at the concept of manned-unmanned teaming. I'm just going to call it teaming from here on out. This is where you combine manned and unmanned platforms into a single team, working together to support each other. You may, for example, have an aviation strike package that consists of four manned aircraft that are controlling a supporting force of 12 or 16 drone platforms. The humans are there to observe, to think, to decide, and to act. The drones, meanwhile, will be there to do what drones do best, namely what they're told, whether that be carrying vital payloads or acting defensively to keep the manned platforms alive. In an aviation concept, you may also have heard this described as the loyal wingman concept. Loyalty in this scenario, I can only assume, means that they'll help you out whenever you need it, and they won't give you even a little bit of sass after doing so. Although I guess if the silence ends up making pilots feel uncomfortable, they can always add a sarcasm and quips DLC later on. The theoretical value of this sort of compromise should be obvious on its face. The unit or strike package still has a human brain or brains making decisions and calling the shots. But you also now have a family of drones with all the potential tactical advantages that brings, 
and making it far easier to decide who in the unit gets the suicide mission if the job ever comes up. But today's video isn't about teaming more generally, it's about aviation specifically. Make no mistake, armies and navies are very much interested in unmanned platforms or already using them in a variety of roles, and most infantry troops probably aren't going to say no to having a robot come along to do stuff like carry their stuff for them. But in the air, there's some particular imperatives to get teaming going, and I'm going to split just some of those into two categories the technical and physical on one hand, and the contextual on the other. In terms of technical and physical factors, there's a couple of reasons you might really want to use drones when it comes to air combat. For one, this is a domain where weight and volume is at an absolute premium. Now obviously those things matter everywhere, but you can get away with a lot more in terms of adding weight and volume to something like a ship that is required to float, as opposed to an airframe which is required to fly. And one of the great ways to save on weight and volume in an airframe is to remove the one or more squishy humans that are normally required to inhabit it. Humans require oxygen, cockpit space, interfaces, canopies and surfaces that allow them to see outside their aircraft, and the selfish bastards usually even demand ejector seats so if things go wrong they can leave the aircraft in a hurry. Human frailties also put some limits on performance that are probably more applicable in the air than they are on other domains. Humans, for example, have a limited g-force tolerance before bad things happen like them beginning to pass out. On the ground or in a submarine, g-force tolerance probably isn't going to matter that much. But in an aircraft, those human frailties do put an upper limit on the potential performance of the platform. Strip the pilot out and you can perform whatever sort of weird and wacky manoeuvres the materials the thing is made of can tolerate. This is also just a domain where having the best platform possible tends to matter a lot. If you talk about ground combat in Ukraine, artillery designs from the 1950s and 60s may not be everyone's first preference, but they are proving useful. If you gave a company of infantry in Ukraine M1 rifles from the Second World War, it wouldn't be optimal, they'd very much miss their AKs or equivalents, but they'd still be dangerous, they'd still potentially be able to do their job. But in air combat, a technology gap like that would border on the insurmountable. You take an F-22 Raptor up against a bunch of 1960s era jets, and it's going to be less slight mismatch and more like Conor McGregor fighting a blindfolded 10-year-old. It may also be a fair generalisation to say that while humans might view air combat as more complicated than fighting on the ground, if you're talking about programming a drone to operate there, it might actually be considerably simpler. The surface tends to be cluttered and confusing. You might have topography and building that break sight lines absolutely everywhere. You might have a huge number of potential tracks ranging from trees blowing in the wind to animals to civilians milling about or moving giggling cardboard boxes. And getting a drone to see and properly understand that environment can be pretty challenging. But in the air, things are simpler. With radar and other sensors, you're usually going to be able to see a lot further unobstructed. There's a lot less clutter, the rules are easier to explain to a machine. Remember after all that we had aircraft autopilot before we had self-driving cars. And the things you do encounter up there are probably going to be easier to categorise and track. I mean, if you think about it, there's another domain where most of these factors apply just to an even greater degree. And that's space. An environment where, as a result, our use of unmanned platforms massively exceeds our use of manned missions. And while the situation in the atmosphere isn't as extreme, there are still some pretty strong arguments in favour of drone use there. In terms of context, modern airspace can be a very transparent and very dangerous place to be. That's particularly true if you're in an older manned platform and your opponent is good at air defence work. We've arguably seen this in Ukraine where the VKS, with arguably one of the largest combat air forces in the world, and it should be said a decent number of some pretty advanced fourth generation platforms, has basically spent more than 18 months cowering on its side of the contact line or operating at extremely low level, in fear of what are, to this day, still overwhelmingly Soviet-era air defence systems. To illustrate this point a bit using my top tier Microsoft Paint skills, think of airspace as falling into three broad threat brackets. Areas where the threat level is high or the airspace is denied, areas where the threat level might be more moderate, and those places where the threat level is relatively low. All else being equal, you expect the closer you get to your enemy's defences, the more likely you are to be in a red zone. But you can also conceive a lot of scenarios where the red zone is exactly where your targets are going to be. However, those threat levels mean that what platforms or systems can reasonably operate there is also likely to be restricted. If you're something slow and vulnerable like an AWACS plane or a B-52 strategic bomber, you're an outsider. You're probably stuck in that low threat zone. If you want to fight in a more medium threat level, you're either going to need to be much more survivable than the outsiders, 
Perhaps you're an aircraft like F-22 or F-35 with a low radar cross-section that's relatively difficult to find. Or maybe you're something like a high-end drone system that while not completely throwaway, and while probably having some decent stealthy or defensive features, is disposable enough that you can just take the hit occasionally. Meanwhile, if you want to fight in that red zone, that very high-risk environment, then you're going to need to dial either the survivability or the disposability of the platform up to another level again. And as sensors and air defense systems continue to improve, that red zone gets ever more dangerous and often ever larger. Closely tied to that first observation is the general expectation that in a future peer-on-peer -peer aerial conflict, everyone involved is going to need to use and lose a lot of aircraft. This is a prediction you see coming out of Western war games being written into defense journals and also being borne out by the war in Ukraine. On the peer battlefield, there are probably going to be a lot of sensors and a lot of missiles out there, combined with a lot of targets you need to try and service. So you're looking at a very dangerous area where you're going to need to fly a lot of missions using a lot of platforms. You can train your pilots to be as good as they can be, and you probably should, but on paper, the probabilities there get pretty oppressive pretty quickly. So if you want to be dominant in that sort of environment, what you really need is the ability to survive in that dangerous environment while having an awful lot of stuff in your inventory. The problem from a defense economics perspective is that those two objectives don't really go together. When we previously looked at sixth generation fighter programs, you probably noticed a trend. In order to survive and operate in an incredibly challenging environment, they are all massively blinged up. If you look at the manned component of the US Air Force program, for example, I think I described it as them wanting something that was one step short of a UFO. All these designs are likely to include stealth features, internally stowed weapons, defensive suites, etc. to enable them to survive in a super challenging environment. But doing that means one, these designs are likely to have limited payloads relative to their size, precisely because they'll often have to operate using internal weapon bays only. Mounting non-stealthy ordnance externally on a stealthy platform is kind of like stringing Christmas lights through your camo netting. You're going to be lighting the thing up for everyone to see. The other impact is these things are likely to be very expensive, and because nations have inherently limited military budgets and lots of competing priorities, there probably aren't going to be many of them. A limited air fleet plus limited payload per aircraft equals a more limited supply of ordnance or whatever payload you like that you can bring to the fight. But these potentially very advanced, survivable, expensive, and extremely digitized platforms also provide an opportunity because a super digitized survival platform is exactly the kind of thing you'd want if you want to make a teaming concept work. These aircraft are likely to have the right combination of sensors and communication equipment to communicate and effectively control unmanned teammates, and then to fuse the information being fed into them through the relevant network. That's not to say older aircraft won't be able to operate with unmanned teammates, the functionality might just be limited or less convenient. You could probably team drones with people in a World War I biplane if you really wanted, as long as you were happy to stick someone in there with a laptop and a Starlink terminal. But you're probably going to get better results if your aircraft has an advanced communication system, a purpose-designed interface, and an advanced fusion engine to do all the work of stitching together all that incoming information for you. And the drone wingmen in turn can try and cover for some of the shortfalls of potential sixth generation platforms, filling a number of roles that we'll quickly go through now. Basically, think of what we're about to do as trying to build up a sports team. We've got our manned platform that's going to be calling the plays, so let's start filling out our roster. And when you're talking about an air combat team, that means adding a couple of shooters that can help us solve our payload problem. The idea here is pretty simple. If we can't find room to fit something on the aircraft, how about we just put it on a drone and have the drone follow the aircraft instead? An example of something you might be able to do here is an ICU shoot system wherein the sixth generation fighter with all of its advanced sensors finds the target, the human operator makes the decision to engage that target, but when the decision to engage is made, the missile isn't fired from the manned aircraft, it's fired from one of the accompanying drones. That also has the added benefit of the manned platform not having to open its weapon bays and thus making itself temporarily more visible to enemy sensors. This fulfills all those basic human control requirements we talked about earlier. A human is still positively identifying the target and making the decision to engage, it's just giving them a much larger pool of missiles or bombs to engage the target with. And hypothetically, you could scale the number of drone systems up almost arbitrarily. Give an F-35 pilot, for example, access to a couple of squadrons of supporting drone wingmen, and they're going to feel like they're playing an ace combat game. As their system starts telling them they have enough AMRAMs on tap to shoot down half the Russian fighter force. 
This is very much already an established concept. For example, despite the fact that the F-35 and F-22 both exist, the US Air Force and a number of other countries are buying or looking at buying the F-15EX. F-15EX is not a fifth generation design, it's a highly upgraded fourth gen with no stealth characteristics. That means compared to F-22, B-21 or F-35, it's much less likely that it will be able to safely enter highly defended airspace. It's also not really that cheap, so why on earth would you buy it? And one of the answers is pretty simply payload. F-35 can carry four AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles internally, F-22 can carry six, and F-15EX can carry 12. Plus, because a lot of those missiles are being carried externally, if in future larger missiles become available that don't fit inside the internal bays of something like the F-35, the F-15EX should potentially be able to carry them. So the concept here is that F-15EX operates as a sort of outsider missile truck, staying a little bit further away from the action, keeping itself a little bit safe, but providing the missile systems with which to engage targets that are being found by things like F-22, F-35, or in the future, NGAD. There are materials coming out of China talking about them doing similar things using J-20 as the spotter and various fourth generation aircraft as the shooters. But there are a couple of problems with this approach compared to using drones to carry the missiles including the fact that the missile carrier is still pretty expensive, not particularly survivable, and as a result has to stay further away from targets and is still putting at least one human and potentially more at risk. Put those missiles on a small stealthy drone by comparison, you can get closer to your target and also take more risks because if you lose it, well, you're causing pain at the treasury office, but you're not draping a flag over a coffin. Now, this is obviously a relatively new and still very much evolving concept. So as you can imagine, there are a couple of permutations and ideas floating out there. Firstly, you can get a little creative with where exactly the ordnance is carried. We've talked about putting them on a fourth generation missile truck or on a loyal wingman style drone, but then you've also got something like DARPA's long shot program where what you do is build a small drone that carries air to air missiles, and once you get relatively close to your target, you might then choose to launch that missile carrying drone from the fourth generation missile truck or cargo plane that's carrying it. It can then fly ahead of the launching platform carrying those air to air missiles in its internal bays, deep into more dangerous airspace. And then with the long shot now firing around near where the enemy is likely to be, you might now be able to have platforms task its missiles against enemy targets. We'll see something similar when we talk about Europe's remote carrier concept a little bit later on. You can probably get this thing some pretty significant range while also keeping it small and difficult to see on radar. That means when the decision is made to launch the air-to-air -air missiles being carried by the long shot, they're much closer to the target than they would be if they were carried on any of the manned systems involved. That matters not just because it increases your reach in general and helps you keep more vulnerable platforms further away from the enemy, but also because it might increase the odds of you launching a missile from inside its so-called no escape radius. Missiles only have so much maneuvering energy. The closer they are to the target, the less energy they have to expend just getting to the location in the first place, the more odds they're going to have energy left over in order to manoeuvre and hit what they're aiming at. This is why a system like S-300 or R-37 can claim to have several hundred kilometres of reach, but against anything that can potentially manoeuvre or turn around and fly in the other direction, that range is significantly reduced. Because now you need to spend energy not just getting to the target, but making sure you hit it. Another version that we are almost certain to see is an environment where the missiles, the sensors and the decision maker are all on separate platforms. This is less I see you shoot as they see I decide you shoot. A pilot might receive information that allows them to identify a target from drones that are flying well ahead of their platform. They can then look at that track and do the human part of the process, analysing it and making the decision to shoot or not shoot. And if they then do decide that that track should be removed from their airspace, then the missile can be launched from another drone, missile carrier or whatever is carrying the ordnance. These and many other concepts are being or will be tested in both simulated and real environments, and I expect we'll be seeing these concepts mature and evolve in the coming years and decades. Another use, one we may see even before we see wingman weapon carriers, is using drone wingmen to carry sensor equipment or carry out e-war missions. Now, there may be limitations here, particularly when you're talking about the largest, heaviest, most energy-intensive sensor systems. I would, for example, pass my personal congratulations to any engineer who figured out how to mount an AWACS radar dome on a small and affordable drone, for example. But you can see why the basic concept might be very attractive. With more sensors on more platforms, you can cover more territory, expand out your sensor network, push sensors forward into dangerous areas, 
and reduce the impetus on a manned platform to go poke its nose somewhere that might be very, very dangerous. Theoretically, you can imagine this kind of thing being particularly useful when you have stealthy aircraft involved on both sides. If you're looking at a low observable platform, one of the answers is to get the right sensors as close to it as possible. But if you do that using your aircraft, you're getting close in the process and so you're probably just gonna end up seeing each other. Put your sensors on a drone and get that close, however, and you might get an I see you, but you don't see me situation, otherwise known as winning. Another point here is that radar cross-section isn't gonna be equal from all angles. So even if an opponent is coming at me head on, for example, and as a result is very difficult for me to see, if I can pull and fuse information from sensors distributed across a wide network, well, maybe someone seeing that track side on and getting a much better return, giving me the information I need to effectively engage and defend myself. A key note there, however, is that that only works if all the systems involved are effectively networked, can communicate, and the information is properly fused. If I'm just getting a bunch of disjointed, potentially duplicative information from all the sensors on my network, it's not gonna enable me to make quick decisions which is why the quality of the software and computer systems on board the manned platform is so important. A bunch of data inputs is great, but only if it's fused and transformed into useful information that enables aircrew to make decisions. I don't want 12 screens telling me what each individual sensor on each involved platform sees. I'm probably gonna prefer to have one view in which all of that information has already been fused together to tell me what is probably out there. Meanwhile, whether you're talking about certain sensor systems or electronic warfare, there's also another note. Yes, there's the general advantage of putting the payload on a different platform so you don't have to find a way to stick it on the manned aircraft, but it also means if you ever start emitting in the EM spectrum with all the subtlety of death metal music piped through concert scale speakers, if someone decides to take a shot at the source of that emission, it's going to be a drone, not a manned aircraft. Remember, there are a lot of munitions out there that have home on jam capability and anti-radiation missiles like HARM work to target air defense radars precisely because you can't really hide those sort of emissions. So no matter how careful you're gonna be with your EM emissions in general, it's still probably preferable that all else equal, they're coming from a drone, not the manned aircraft, which leads very well to discussing another potential role of wingman drones, that is, keeping the manned systems alive. For any air force, losing a top-tiered platform and potentially its pilot is already a major loss, losing a potentially multi-crewed sixth generation platform would be even more so. So there are a bunch of ways the drones might help, not the least of which is potentially giving an opponent more things to shoot at. We already have things like the ADM 160 decoy that can make itself look like certain manned aircraft. Now you might also have the drones providing additional tracks and potentially launching some decoys themselves if you wanna play a game of decoyception. There are a huge variety of utility roles these wingman drones could potentially provide. And worst come to worst, catching missiles for their human wingmates might be part of the job description. One thing we haven't talked about in all this is the potential to instruct wingmen to engage targets semi-autonomously. That is, instead of a pilot just metaphorically pulling the trigger on a missile being carried by a wingman drone, what if instead the pilot issued the instruction for a wingman drone to go dogfight with that target or go bomb that location? it's still semi-autonomous in the sense that the human decision maker is selecting the target and making the decision to destroy it, but exactly how to do it, whether it be a simple or rather complex series of maneuvers, is up to the wingman drone. From an economy perspective, this is potentially a very attractive concept. If instead of firing a one-use cruise missile at a target, I can fire a drone at that target which drops a cheap bomb on it and then returns to be reused, well, I've saved myself a considerable amount in ordnance potentially while risking exactly the same number of aircrew. The main challenge here is making sure the drone is capable of doing what it's told to do. In the US and other places, for example, we've seen reported exercises where a jet flown by a computer is matched up against a human piloted one, and in a dogfighting environment, the computer has often done very well. However, in a lot of the simulations we've seen reported about, the deck has been stacked pretty heavily in favor of the computer. Doing things like example, giving the computer perfect information as to where its human opponent is at all times so it doesn't have to make decisions based on imperfect and incomplete information. Computers don't like incomplete information or the unknown, just remember the cardboard box incident from earlier. But with improvements over time, this role might become more viable, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later on. Because what I wanna do now is pivot from talking about the theoretical and the conceptual to the actual looking at what we know or think we know about some of the national programs out there and what clues they might give us as to how these systems are gonna evolve. We've talked about the manned component of the UK's Future Combat Air System or FCAS program before. 
That'll be a manned sixth-generation fighter currently being designed by Japan, the UK and Italy, likely to be called Tempest if it enters into RAF service. But FCAS is meant to be a system of systems, one where unmanned and manned systems operate together using teaming concepts. Now, as a side note, remember this can get confusing because there are two FCAS programs, one in the UK and the other is a combined Franco-German-Spanish effort. Now, why the Brits didn't just call it the future air combat system so they could say that fax is the technology of the future is absolutely beyond me. But in the end, we are where we are. A key component of FCAS that's meant to operate alongside Tempest is the lightweight, affordable, novel combat aircraft, or Lunker. The concept for some sort of loyal wingman-style drone has been around in the UK for quite a number of years. And in 2022, we saw them coming up with a technology demonstrator to show off and test the concept, the so-called Spirit Mosquito. When the program was infused with £30 million in early 2021, the UK's Director of Future Combat Air, Richard Burthon, said that Project Mosquito was a vital element of their approach and specifically said, quote, autonomous loyal wingman aircraft create the opportunity to expand, diversify, and rapidly upgrade combat air forces in a cost-effective way. Meanwhile, the chief of the air staff said, quote, we're taking a revolutionary approach, looking at a game-changing mix of swarm drones and uncrewed fighter aircraft like Mosquito, alongside piloted fighters like Tempest, suggesting to me that the UK saw the future as a mixture of manned platforms, larger, more capable drones, and small, cheap swarming ones. And so the Mosquito program evolved under the leadership of Spirit Aerosystems out of Belfast. For a while, it looked like we might be seeing a significant success for the British aerospace sector. And so, of course, in 2022, the news came out that the program had been discontinued. With Mosquito being wound up, we're a little bit less sure of where Lunker and the UK's aerial drone ambitions in the future are now going. There are some clues to be found in the comments various parties made when it was announced that the program would not be going ahead. Air Chief Marshal Mike Wigston said that the focus would be on systems that could be operationalised at a much faster pace, presumably than Mosquito. Air Commodore Jez Holmes over at the Rapid Capabilities Office said that they were still going to aggressively pursue the RAF's unchanged and firm commitment to integrate unmanned systems into the near-term force mix with more immediate beneficial value. Meanwhile, there was also a press release which said, quote, analysis concluded that more beneficial capability and cost-effectiveness appears achievable through exploration of smaller, less costly, but still highly capable additive capabilities, end quote. Now, I can try to translate the government speak here, but be aware that everything that follows here is obviously speculation. Those statements sound an awful lot like the Mosquito program surfaced some unfortunate truths. Namely, that building a full-size, loyal wingman-style drone with all the capabilities they wanted was going to be A, very expensive, and B, take a long time to do. And so it looks an awful lot like they're looking at technologies they can field more rapidly and more cheaply, even if they don't give all of the Mosquito-type capabilities. It probably doesn't mean that a full-scale, full-capability wingman-type drone is out of the UK's thinking, but it does, I think, increase the odds of them buying a design off the shelf, like the Australian Ghost Bat, for example, a system that already exists, is much further along in its development, is capable of carrying a variety of sensor payloads and which was designed with operation alongside aircraft like F-35 in mind. Patriotic fervour basically demands, I suggest the UK government commit to buying a relatively humble quantity, uh, 500 or so should do it, which will of course save many of the development costs and risks that would come from developing a purely UK-based system. But it probably does mean that in the short term at least, the RAF's focus is going to be on something smaller, cheaper, simpler, that can be put into the field quickly to augment the existing Typhoon and F-35-based force. And that thinking, smaller, cheaper, simpler, and potentially disposable, seems to already be where the mainland European thinking is at on this topic. Now, as I said, the European effort in English is called FCAS, just like the UK effort, so you'll often see publications use the French name SCAF instead to differentiate it from its UK competitor. But I like being a little bit different sometimes, and Spain is part of the program, so we're going to go with the Spanish FSAC, the Futuro Sistema Aereo de Combate. And it must be said, my greatest apologies to the Spanish speakers in the audience. Now, like the other programs, the European one is a system of systems approach. You have the manned six-generation platform that'll enter service sometime after the French, Germans and Spaniards manage to work out the industrial arrangements, so whether that's before or after humanity invents the warp drive, we'll have to see. You have a combat cloud and a variety of networking technologies, and you have the drones. In the case of FSAC, the drones I most commonly seen talked about are the so-called remote carriers. We've seen a variety of potential use cases for the remote carriers talked about, including acting as decoys, providing sensor and electronic warfare platforms, and other familiar mission types. 
The difference, however, is that what the Europeans seem to be describing is something much closer to a munition than an unmanned aircraft. And I say that because the concepts we've seen have all been air-launched. They don't take off under their own power, fly alongside the manned equivalent, and then land on an airfield. They're carried to the target by an aircraft, launched when you get to the battle space, and are probably never recovered. Some of the materials put out by Airbus show these things being pushed out the back of cargo planes in order to get them into action. Interestingly, the USA also has a similar concept to this one, the X-61 Gremlin, which is also launched from a cargo plane. But in that case, they're also testing recovering the drones back into the launching aircraft after their mission is complete. The remote carriers, by contrast, seem to be a one-and-done type of situation. This is something it seems designed to operate in a European context, where ranges are much lower than somewhere like the Pacific, and the emphasis is less on having a long-range, sustainable, reusable strike asset, and more on allowing a relatively small air force to really turn up with the numbers pretty intensively for the first couple of days or weeks of a conflict until you start running out of the things. In terms of demonstrators and concepts, one that's been reported on is an MDBA concept for an expendable remote carrier weighing 400 kilograms, flying at subsonic speeds, with one hour of endurance. In terms of capability and concept, that's probably closer to something like DARPA's long shot than it is to something like Ghost Bat or Mosquito. And with that kind of approach, which is obviously by no means final, you'd have both your strengths and weaknesses. In terms of strengths, being small, cheap and disposable means you'd be able to build, carry and launch a lot of them. Truck a bunch of these to the combat zone, potentially even in platforms like cargo planes. And then when you decide to pull the trigger, potentially for the next hour, your air force that may only launch 24 manned fighters, for example, might temporarily be able to act like it's an air force made up of hundreds of aircraft. Your pilots would temporarily become swarm lords directing their hive mind of sensors, jammers, and munitions. But the problem of going small and disposable is that you're small and disposable. There's only so much payload you can fit into a design this size, and kind of like temporary summons in a strategy game, you've only got them for a limited while. Launch the swarm and you may temporarily have the numbers advantage, but that hour is always ticking away. Okay, so in summary, European nations like France, Germany and Spain have looked at the requirements of a potential future air war in Europe and seem to have decided that for now at least, that those requirements merit focusing efforts on a teaming drone that is small, cheap and disposable. So you might imagine that the Russians developing their requirements, also considering the possibility of fighting a future air war in Europe, might come up with something similar. However, if that's what you did imagine, then you'd be very wrong, because Russia appears to have looked at their requirements and have come up with something whose engine alone weighs almost four times as much as the entire ERC concept. This is the Sukhoi S-70 Okotnik, or Hunter, and almost everything we can say about it is based almost entirely on Russian claims about the same. Russian media have described the thing as a heavy attack drone and has also carried commentary by Russian observers noting the similarity between the apparent S-70 design and other prototypes or concepts we've seen in the US, like for example the Northrop Grumman X-47B. And the Russians are very clear that they do have teaming sort of functions in mind for the S-70. TASS reported back in 2019 that Okotnik had done its first flight with the Sukhoi 57. In 2021, we were told that sources were suggesting that up to four Okotnik drones could be controlled by every Su-57. And there has already been an exercise done where sensor data is shared between the Su-57 and the S-70, something that would enable a uc i shoot kind of scenario. And there's one other obvious feature that sets this system apart from some of its competitors. Unlike things like the Mosquito or the remote carrier, Okotnik is actually flying. That makes the S-70 conceptually at least quite impressive. But for now, it seems to suffer the two great curses that afflict so much next-generation technology that comes out of the Russian defense industrial base. One, we have no idea if it can actually do even half of the things they say it can do. And two, there's reason to doubt the planned production quantities and timelines. Is T-14 the best tank in the world or a non-functional dumpster fire? Is Sukhoi-57 a fifth-generation fighter or a flanker cosplaying as one? And is S-70 a groundbreaking combat drone or just something that looks like one? The internet absolutely loves arguing about those sort of questions. But from a defense economics perspective, it almost doesn't matter. Blueprints alone do not win battles. Because whether a system is good or complete trash does not matter if you do not build it and field it. There are perhaps a squadron and change worth of serial production Sukhoi 57s. We have never seen a T-14 actively fighting on the front line, and there are two, 
count them too, as 70s. So I don't really doubt the ability of Russian designers to come up with something that can do teaming operations effectively. What I'm far more sceptical about is the ability of a country currently mired in a major ground war to find the resources necessary to refine this thing and then field it at scale. Building things at scale is not, however, a drawback you associate with the People's Republic of China. And they are also known to have a number of designs in development or testing, with the one on the screen there being a 2019 version of the GJ-11 Sharp Sword. Now, trying to assess Chinese progress in developing manned unmanned teaming concepts and the drones to go with it suffers from basically the same drawback as assessing Chinese progress in any other area of military development. Namely, if you're an outside observer, half the time you have absolutely no idea what on earth is going on. We know that new drones and aircraft are being developed and fielded. We know that a lot of money is going into military development. But you're not going to get publicly released project-by-project project budget figures the way you would somewhere else like the United States. But if you're asking the question, is China interested in drone teaming concepts, the answer is obviously yes. Chinese state media has released computer-generated images of sharp swords and J-20s operating together as a team. We've also seen the state-run Aviation Industry Corporation of China put out a video, obviously computer-generated, showing sharp swords taking off from a ship, and then as they approach their targets, launching decoys or small drones in order to enable their attack. And as a potentially interesting side note, that promotional footage didn't seem to include any manned aircraft taking part in the operation. The fundamental point is that we have enough information to be pretty confident that a lot of development work is taking place in the People's Republic of China, and that their conception of next-generation air combat includes teaming between manned and unmanned platforms, but nowhere near enough information to be exactly sure how far along the development and fielding process they are or what their target endpoint is. Which means that in order to have a more detailed look at a specific program, we're going to go back to the United States, and specifically the US Air Force's CCA, or Collaborative Combat Aircraft. I'll note here that the Americans have a huge array of drone programs in various stages of development, but my focus here is going to be on the larger teaming ones. Now, even though the Americans publish a lot more information on project design and budgeting than the Chinese do, keep in mind that a lot of what we're talking about here is still going to be pretty heavily mired in speculation. And we'll start with a familiar topic if you've watched my previous video on the subject, the US Air Force Next Generation Air Dominance Fighter. Aircraft are usually shaped by their requirements, and the ones for the NGAD are likely to be pretty demanding. That means that compared to other fighters before it, like F-22, I wouldn't be surprised if NGAD was larger more expensive, but as or even more outrageously ambitious. I'd argue you can see that mentality channeled in the FY 2024 force posture statement for the US Air Force. In it, they say, and I quote, as the combat environment and character of war continue to evolve, our determination to be the leader in speed, agility, and lethality remains an irreplaceable role for the joint team and our allies and partners. In other words, the US Air Force isn't interested in just keeping up with everyone else. They've spent decades getting used to enjoying overmatch over potential opponents. And so they don't seem to want a fighter that can just operate and survive in future combat conditions. They want something, as the name suggests, that can dominate it. And you know what? There's probably a very real chance that the US aerospace sector is able to deliver on that design brief. But what they almost certainly won't be able to do is deliver on it cheaply. Secretary Kendall has already said that the NGAD will probably cost hundreds of millions of US dollars per unit. And the initial buy target we keep hearing, 200, might be enough to replace the service's F-22 Raptors, but at least in terms of platform count, not much else. The US Air Force wants to find a way to roll out the newest and greatest technology, while also arresting the continuous shrinking in the force that is happening as older airframes like F-15 and F-16 start to age out. The US defense budget may be the largest in the world, but even it has limits. And so the hope seems to be that various sorts of collaborative combat aircraft might help solve that problem. It's meant to be a way for the Air Force to get more airframes in the air affordably, while also getting the best possible performance out of its extremely blinged out manned platforms. The quotes we have from senior US leaders give us plenty of clues as to how they intend to use them. Lieutenant General Richard Moore Jr., the Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, described the CCAs as falling into a couple of roles the highest priority of which were shooters, electronic warfare platforms, and sensor carriers. Basically systems that could see the enemy, shoot the enemy, and make sure they don't shoot back. Other quotes have referred to the CCAs as essentially remote-controlled versions of the targeting or electronic warfare pods or weapons that aircraft currently carry. 
With the idea here being that you would add a number of CCAs with specific payloads to a strike package or unit to help it carry out a particular mission. Want to go mess with some air defense systems? Okay, take a CCA or two with a good electronic warfare suite, then bring a bunch more carrying anti-radiation missiles like the Harm, until you have enough ordnance on hand to either confidently complete the planned mission or make the pilot feel like they've just unlocked an infinite ammo cheat, whatever comes first. And that points to something that is so often lost, I think, in internet debates over which aircraft is better than which other aircraft. And I get it, it's a lot of fun to do hypotheticals between Sukhoi 57 and F-35, for example. But at a big picture level, I'd argue it's usually going to be less important what any individual aircraft can do, and instead the emphasis should probably be on the effectiveness of units or the overall joint force. You're not going to send one aircraft normally to break down an opposing air defence system, you're going to put together strike packages. You might combine different sorts of attack aircraft, different munitions, all supported by things like AWACS. And what matters is not what any individual jet is able to do, but rather what the unit is able to do. And by mixing and matching or adding and subtracting CCAs to a unit before it flies an operation, the idea is you might be able to customise that unit to add capabilities to that base NGAD or F-35 at the centre to make sure that it's able to do what you need it to do, preferably as safely as possible. But for that to work, the Air Force needs to buy a lot of them, and that seems to be the plan. US officials have said they expect the CCA to cost considerably less than the F-35, and for planning purposes, the service is currently assuming they'll buy at least a 1,000 of them. That figure is apparently based on giving each of the 200 NGADs two CCA helpers, plus giving 300 F-35s a pair as well. Now, there's two things that should be stressed about that number. The first is it's just an initial planning figure. Secretary Kendall and others have very publicly floated the idea of buying considerably more, and numbers of up to 2,000 have been mentioned. The second is there's no reason to think the CCAs would be married to any particular aircraft. You might be budgeting on the basis that every NGAD gets two and some of the F-35 fleet gets two each, but there's nothing to say that in a particularly high-stress environment you might pull some of those CCAs, bring them in from the rest of the force, and allow each of the manned fighters operating there to fly with three, four, or even five of the things. CCA is likely to be much larger and more complex than some of the other drone systems we've talked about, but it's still probably going to have a much lower logistical footprint than F-35 or NGAD. Meaning that if the proverbial shit hits the fan and you want to surge airframes into a region, it might be quicker and easier to bring in a large number of these things than bring in an equivalent number of manned aircraft. It should also be stressed that even though CCA is likely on the more complex, more expensive side of the various teaming drones we've talked about, that doesn't mean the US is ignoring the possibility of cheap ones. They're just largely being covered by other programs and other efforts, and we'll talk about them another time. Now, the competition to be America's next top combat drone hasn't started yet. We expect that in 2024. And for those with the clearance to follow it, I expect it'll be one heck of a runway show. But there have already been some systems mentioned as potential entrants or competitors by senior US officials. And that in turn might give us a broad idea of what they're after in terms of capability and payload. One that's been mentioned is the XQ-58 Valkyrie, and another the MQ-28 Ghostbat. These designs would obviously have to evolve significantly, but they do suggest a larger unmanned aircraft capable of taking off and landing under its own power, while also being significantly cheaper than F-35. In any case, the next stage for CCA in 2024 is probably the opening of wider competition. Like the Europeans, the US seems to be in a considerable hurry and may be looking to field CCA before NGAD arrives. The current budget request for CCA is 5.8 billion US dollars over the course of five years, which should instantly highlight some of the difficulties that we're probably facing Project Mosquito in the UK. At the end of the day, there's just a difference between throwing tens of millions of pounds at a problem and billions of dollars. Of course, that's assuming the service gets the money, which is currently not at all certain. At time of recording, for example, the version of the National Defense Authorization Act that was authored in the US House of Representatives includes a provision that sets cost limits for individual CCA aircraft. Those are 3 million US for each expendable CCA, so a one-use analogue to something like the European remote carrier system we talked about earlier, 10 million for any CCA drone that was attritable, that is, reusable, but you were fine with losing them in combat, and 25 million per unit for a so-called exquisite model, which is one meant to be reused and whose loss would be deemed not acceptable. Now, some might see some of those costs and definitions as being a little bit strange. For one, the Air Force has said they plan two CCA increments, not three, 
with some statements suggesting the Air Force doesn't intend the larger CCAs to actually be attritable per se, cheaper and available for higher risk operations than human-operated aircraft, sure, but not something best thought of as highly attritable. And secondly, I think there's reason to find the definition of the exquisite model interesting, because you have to imagine in a peer-on-peer fight, there'd be occasions where the loss of any aircraft, even a manned one, would occasionally be considered acceptable. In any case, there's every possibility that by the time this video releases, this issue will have been debated between the House and the Senate and resolved one way or the other. I just bring it up because it highlights the fact very well that all sorts of weird and wonderful things can happen to programs before they reach fruition, and that when it comes to defence development and procurement, you really should never take anything for granted. If you want an example of how much and how quickly things can change, just a year or two ago, the US was talking about potentially having a CCA-like drone to support not the fighter force, but rather the B-21 strategic bombers. Secretary Kendall specifically talked about an affordable family of systems to be associated with the B-21, including an uncrewed combat aircraft with, quote, comparable range, end quote. Now, keep in mind, the B-21 is the sort of aircraft you call when you want to send a message from half a world away. So a drone intended to match that reach would probably have to be some combination of addicted to mid-air refuelling, or be, to use the technical term for a moment, an absolute bloody chonker. More recently, Secretary Kendall has said that concept was found to be, quote, cost ineffective, end quote. But it does seem like the US is now looking at alternatives. One is the B-21 flying most of the way towards the target by itself and then joining its escorting CCAs on the way in. Or alternatively, a somewhat cryptic clue about the B-21 being able to carry things that aren't conventional bombs or missiles. Of course, it should be said the B-21 probably does have some advantages as a drone control platform. It's a large aircraft, so you probably have the room on board for the sort of control systems and interfaces you need. You have multiple crewmen, so someone probably has the bandwidth to monitor and control the drones. And because it's a subsonic stealthy bomber, it's pretty easy to design a stealthy drone that is fast enough to keep up with the thing. Ultimately, the final picture of the program will play out in the coming years and even decades. But even now, the potential strategic implications are pretty apparent. The CCA drones are meant to give the US Air Force a way to generate the required mass to get enough sensors, enough jammers, enough weapons, enough airframes into the sky in contested airspace, despite the enormous expense involved in fielding next-generation manned platforms. They're probably not a complete solution to the problem of affordability or an aging air fleet, but it's probably a better answer than just doubling the defence budget and telling every American you're bringing in a special NGAD tax. The robots are almost certainly coming to take certain Air Force jobs. But given part of that job probably includes being the one to jump on any metaphorical grenades if the need ever arises, I doubt the pilots are going to feel particularly jealous. The US Air Force strike package of the future is a manned unmanned team, and everyone has their role. So let's zoom out again and start talking about predictions. Because with countries around the world working on different versions of this concept, what might we expect to see when they finally start fielding wingman drones in combat-type operations? If we see these systems fielded quickly, I think it's likely that they'll be limited to relatively simple roles. Designing an unmanned aircraft isn't particularly difficult. Designing a smart, semi-automated one, well, it's considerably more so. The brain, for lack of a better term, in these systems is likely to be somewhat limited. So the first generation are probably going to be less Skynet and more StarCraft. They'll probably be able to take off and land, play follow the leader, fly a designated flight path or follow relatively simple set commands, what Secretary Kendall might call set plays. That suggests a focus on missions that basically come down to carrying things for the benefit of the manned platform. Sensors, e-war equipment, additional munitions, anything you might want to potentially bring along to support the manned platform or potentially push ahead of it. But if you were to field one of these systems right now, there'd probably be an upper limit on how complex the instructions could be, and importantly, how independently the system could act. And sometimes that might be exactly what you want. Sometimes you might not want players who are too prone to improvisation or getting creative, and will instead practice the same collection of set plays until they can reliably perform them with absolute precision. In the manned unmanned team, early wingman type drones are likely to be that sort of player. However, it seems unlikely that that would remain the case forever, because this is the AI era and systems can be taught. So some of these systems may improve and gain new capabilities not because you're improving the actual airframe, but instead because you're just making the system smarter. The evolution here might be something like starting with very simple routines, fly from point A to point B through to more complex plays and expanding mission profiles. Think of something like dogfighting as a potential example, 
and more than that, one that several actors are already testing and training for, through to increasingly adaptive action sets where the drone can make more decisions for itself. And the incredible thing here, from both an investment and a public-facing perspective, is that you're looking at a potentially very impactful arms race that might be largely invisible, while also, it has to be said, being extremely impactful. If you accept, for example, that there is a big difference between a bad pilot and an excellent one, something which I think history bears out pretty well, then you probably understand why having a better brain, a better autonomy core for your drone could be a massive advantage. But while the public might have a good understanding of the performance characteristics of the drones and aircraft involved, how high they can fly, what their maximum speed and payload is, for example, you may never know whether the drones are being flown by the computerised equivalent of the Red Baron Reborn or Ralph Wiggum. And the payoff here for having better programming, for having a better autonomy core, is potentially massive. Because if you get lucky and your Air Force Academy happens to graduate a couple of absolutely top-tier combat pilots, congratulations, you now have a couple of extremely high-tier combat pilots. But one human pilot can only fly one manned aircraft at a time, and their classmates can't exactly absorb their skills by osmosis. Meanwhile, if you develop an absolutely top-tier autonomy core, you can put that in all of your drones. In other words, the entire fleet is going to be as smart as the top of the class. And it may not even be confined to a single platform. The US Skyborg program, for example, has been public for a number of years, and one of the things it's trying to deliver is an autonomy core for unmanned aircraft. And I do mean aircraft plural, because the Skyborg ACS is reported to have successfully flown multiple different aircraft successfully. As Brigadier General Dave White told it in relation to tests in 2021, quote, we had two completely different vendors, two completely different aircraft, and we could use the ACS on both. So when the programmers get it right and the ACS develops a new capability or just gets better at its old ones, it may be not just the entire fleet of that sort of drone that benefits, but rather some of that might filter through to other drone systems as well. In a way, the drone pilots are still very much in drone school. Except drone school is a very ruthless place where the top of the class gets cloned into the entire fleet and everyone else might get archived forever. But you probably will see hardware changes as well. Because as the missions for these teaming drones expand, well, you'd expect their payload to change with it. You probably don't want to mount short-range air-to-air missiles on a drone that doesn't know how to dogfight, for example. But if forces start trying to use them that way, then we would expect the payload to evolve accordingly. Similarly, if new technology or systems are developed, whether those be munitions, directed energy weapons, sensors, jammers, etc., one of the simplest ways planners might have to introduce that into the force structure is simply to bolt it onto an existing drone or design a new one to carry it. And I have to say, from a defence economics perspective, the potential of that approach is pretty exciting, because it might reduce the pressure on you to make uncomfortable or expensive changes to your limited number of expensive manned platforms. For example, let's say that MBDA in Europe comes up with a new generation air-to-air missile that is the absolute shit. It is the best. It is the be-all and end-all of air-to-air combat, and if you mount this thing, you will win. So if you're the Americans, you probably want it. The problem is it doesn't fit into the internal bay of the F-22, the F-35, or whatever sixth-generation fighters you fielded. Now, normally, you could spend a fortune trying to physically modify your aircraft to fit the new munition, or you could bite the bullet and replace them with a whole new generation of aircraft. But in a world of team drone systems, you don't have to. Because if I need to, I can just design a drone capable of carrying the missile and have it integrate into the existing force. And if, from a mission perspective, I'm going to need that particular piece of ordnance, well, I just add those drones to the strike package in question. It's certainly not free, it may not even be cheap, but there may be cases where it's just less of a headache than continually modifying the core man platforms. When the Russians modified MiG-31 to carry Kinzhal, for example, they basically had to kill its ability to function as an interceptor. The opportunity cost of getting a new missile launch platform, whose primary role seems to have been to advertise the Patriot air defence system, was the sacrifice of a useful, capable interceptor. In the world of networked wingman drones, there may be other options available. Of course, one of the questions that always comes up when you talk about the future evolution of drone systems is whether or not eventually they'll be given full autonomy or not. After all, you could argue that's a kind of final frontier for these development efforts. The point where many decisions, including the decision to actively take a human life potentially, is taken out of the hands of a human operator and put into the hands of a machine. And frankly, given the pace at which systems are evolving in Ukraine and the impetus that's given global arms developers, there's probably a lot more impetus for policymakers to look at some of those difficult questions. 
like what does it really mean to have a human in the loop and how general can targeting instructions be? A landmine doesn't pick its final target, but in a sense neither does its human operator. The targeting instruction, if you can call it that, can be as general as the first thing that puts a foot wrong in that field over there. Whether that be an opposing soldier in a couple of days, an enemy vehicle in a month or two, or a civilian four years after the war is over. There are also already weapon systems out there that demonstrate some degree of autonomy. The Israeli Harpy, for example, is advertised as an autonomous loitering munition. The Harpy is sent up to loiter in a particular area, and as soon as it detects the telltale emissions of an enemy air defense system, Harpy can set a course and go introduce itself. The targeting instruction in this case is as general as go to a particular area and kill anything that looks like this target type. So some might question just how big a leap it really is to give something like a teaming drone an instruction to fly into enemy airspace and shoot down anything that looks like an OP-4 combat aircraft. As the systems get more capable and the rewards for enabling autonomous operations only increase, I expect those sort of moral and policy questions to grow ever louder. But given we're more than an hour in, it's probably best if I consign the issue of fully autonomous weapons to a future episode. For most air forces, concepts like teaming represent a natural next step. As to how far we go beyond that, only time will tell. In conclusion, unmanned systems are already changing the way that wars in the air are fought. There's no reason to think that trend is going to reverse anytime soon. But unmanned systems, especially for the moment, also very clearly have their drawbacks. And so global air forces still seem to see a very clear role for humans in the cockpit. In that sense, teaming can be thought of as a way to deliver a force the best of both worlds. The affordability, design flexibility and attributability of a drone, coupled with the awareness, intuition and decision making of a human air crew. There does seem to be some difference between the various global sixth generation programs of where the emphasis is being placed in terms of teaming drones, be that on team cheap and disposable or expensive and reusable, but just about everyone seems interesting in what teaming can do, and most of the major powers are likely to be looking at drone platforms across the weight and capability spectrum. When we first start seeing these systems used to support combat operations in a real way, they'll probably initially be relatively limited. But it's almost inevitable that these systems will not stay static in terms of their level of capability. The economic and technological forces pushing for their wider adoption are ultimately just too great. And with air forces looking to leverage the latest in technology without breaking the budget, I think it's reasonable to assume that we'll be seeing more and more drones taken to the skies in the years to come. Okay, channel update to close out. I've now settled back in, I'm over the jet lag, but now I'm working through a pretty significant backlog of tasks and communications that I've let pile up. So please do bear with me as I do so. So far as today's video go, I'm aware it's been something like nine months since the first sixth generation fighter episode, so I thought it was finally time for a part two, even as work continues on a potential part three, which covers the race not to develop the next generation of manned or unmanned aircraft, but instead the missiles and munitions that they're going to be using. Like I said, I think understanding the big picture often requires looking at how different systems and capabilities fit together. So if the interest is there, that's something I'm interested in doing. For the patrons, by the time this goes live, there should be a topic poll up on the Patreon for you to vote on. And for everyone else, as always, there is just my genuine thanks for your continued support and engagement. Keeping up with these videos can be a lot of work, but I also love doing it. So thank you very much to you and this week's sponsor, 80,000 Hours. And as always, I'll see you again next week.